behind them. One guy stood slightly apart from the others. Jack went to talk to him, pointing out Danny, Bethany and the general. He nodded, made a quick head count, and then divided the sailors into three groups before indicating which bus each group should board. Danny, Bethany and the general were in the right one. Danny winked his thanks to Jack, who ballooned with pride, and then they walked down the platform and along the concrete pier towards the buses. The trio walked in the middle of their group, heads down. The bus's engine was already turning over when they reached it, an impatient and rather sweaty driver sitting at the wheel flicking through his phone. Danny took a seat next to Bethany. The general sat in the seat in front, next to a sailor who obviously had no idea who he was and was more interested in talking excitedly to the guy across the aisle from him. The bus filled up quickly. The doors hissed shut. There was room enough on the enormous pier for the bus's wide turning circle. It trundled away from the frigate and made its way towards the exit of Naval Station Norfolk. It was a 15-minute drive around a perimeter road that passed inlets on the left and the outskirts of the huge naval station infrastructure on the right. This was just a blur in Danny's peripheral vision. He kept his eyes forward, head slightly down, avoiding any interaction with the other passengers. They reached an exit, a lowered barrier manned by several U.S. Navy personnel. The bus came to a halt. The doors hissed open again, and Danny felt a lurch of anxiety. "'What's happening?' Bethany whispered. Danny stopped himself from peering down the aisle to check. His mind turned over. Had the SBS guys messed up? Did the Yanks have some way of knowing that the four-man drop wasn't what it seemed? Getting out of this naval station ought to be straightforward. Had they hit an obstacle? Danny felt hemmed in. The bus offered only a single exit, even if they managed to get off. Leaving the naval base when it was on a security lockdown was a whole other proposition. A man walked along the aisle. He had a square face and a humorless expression, as though this busload of boisterous Brits was somehow beneath him. He was doing nothing, however, but counting heads. Danny tensed up as he approached the general. Would a member of the U.S. military recognize O'Brien at a glance despite his hoodie? He didn't, nor did he look twice at Danny and Bethany. A minute later, he had alighted, and the bus was driving through an open security cordon and out of the base. Danny stood up. There was a lull in the buzz of conversation on the bus as he moved up the aisle and towards the driver. It was a wide road, but mostly deserted. Any vehicles Danny saw were military, not civilian. The sky was changing. The mackerel clouds had become stormier. Bad weather was on its way. You've been told to stop for us, he asked the driver. Just a surly nod by way of response. Danny stayed standing at the top of the aisle. He didn't have to wait long. After a couple of minutes, he saw a black SUV parked up on the side of the road. It was an anomaly, a civilian vehicle abandoned here in the middle of nowhere. This is it, Danny told the driver. At first, he thought the driver wasn't going to stop. Then he understood his passive aggressiveness for what it was. The driver only hit the brakes once they'd passed the SUV. The bus came to a halt 50 metres beyond the vehicle. The driver opened the doors without taking his eyes from the road. Bethany and the general joined Danny up front. They alighted together and the doors hissed shut, almost before they were out of the bus, which immediately eased back out into the road. The general sniffed the air. A storm's coming, he said. Danny nodded. You need to tell me where the memory stick is, he said. I already did, D.C. Where in D.C.? I'll show you when we get there. A couple of heavy raindrops hit the tarmac, leaving wet splodges the size of military medals. We're going to stand here and get wet, or we're going to drive? Danny looked at the sky again. Dark clouds were rolling in from the south. We're going to drive, he said. Danny found the keyless entry fob hidden behind the near side front wheel. He took the driver's seat. The general sat next to him, Bethany in the back. 
The car was new, modern and comfortable. There was a full tank of gas. As Danny turned on the ignition, the general made to key directions into the built-in navigation system. Danny stayed his hand. We put our destination into that. Anybody can read it if they get hold of the car. Nobody knows we're here, the general said. Plenty of people know we're here. Hereford, MI6. You think none of these people have contacts with Washington? We'll find our own way. The general considered that for a moment, then nodded. Route 64, he said. We'll take the bridge tunnel up into the Hamptons, north from there. I'll direct you. That was all Danny needed to know. He turned on the wipers, pulled out into the road, and drove. The weather deteriorated. The spots of rain became more frequent and fell so heavily that they started an irregular drumming on the roof of the SUV. Their route took them over a long bridge spanning the waterway between Norfolk and the Hamptons. By the time they crossed, visibility was barely a few metres on either side. Thunder rolled overhead. Lightning cracked. The sky became twilight dark. Danny kept his foot on the gas. The storm followed. It was as if the elements were tracking them. They sat in silence, not only because they were tense in each other's company, but because the hammering of the rain and the crashing of the thunder made conversation impossible. It slowed them down, too. Whenever Danny saw the speedometer dip below 40 miles per hour, he felt a twist of anxiety in his gut. The day was passing. It was already 1,600 hours. That made it 1,300 on the west coast. The terror attack might happen there, which gave them a few extra hours. He turned on the radio and found a news station. A news anchor spoke in a brash, booming voice of a power struggle between the President and Congress, as if he was discussing the latest celebrity tittle-tattle. But there was no talk of a hit. Not yet. Time crept by. They turned north onto Interstate 95. The storm turned north with them. That was how it felt, at least. The general had said three hours to Washington. Danny estimated that they needed to add another hour to that, maybe more. The afternoon waned. The weather deteriorated further. The closer they grew to the capital, the heavier the rain became. The wipers were on high, necessary but barely effective. A grey mist of road spray surrounded every vehicle on the highway. Evening came. The overhead signs for Washington, D.C. became more frequent. A hundred and fifty miles. A hundred miles. Seventy-five miles. The traffic became heavier. Danny kept his speed at a safe level. It was a challenge. His urge to reach D.C. was strong, but they'd get nowhere if they came off the road, a distinct possibility for anyone travelling at speed in these conditions. By 1900 hours, they were 20 miles out of D.C., and the neon of emergency lights glowed through the downpour up ahead. The traffic slowed to a halt. They crawled past a four-vehicle RTA. Danny knew at a glance that there were fatalities, but his attention was not on the crash or the ambulances. It was on the six police vehicles parked up around the crash site and the police officers in foul-weather gear, some of them dealing with the crash, others waving the traffic jam on. Rain pelted heavily against the windscreen and the side windows. It would be difficult to see into the SUV from outside. It didn't stop Danny's skin from tingling as they drove past the police lights. Next to him, the general pulled up his hood and stared straight ahead. Nobody spoke until they were well past the accident and the traffic moved a little faster. Even then, tension bit the air. We'll head for the centre of the city, the general said. Then I'll tell you where we're going. He looked at his watch. Couple of hours and we'll get this done. Danny drove. Chapter 23 The children were grouchy. Staying up late the previous night watching the fireworks was all catching up with them. They had begged their mum and dad to be allowed to watch the fireworks again this evening, but Rabia had only agreed on the condition that they went back to the hotel for a late afternoon rest. Her decision was unpopular, 
but as soon as the children had lain on their beds, they had fallen asleep. Now it was half past seven. The fireworks wouldn't start until a quarter past nine. Hamoud lay on the bed, watching television to ease his racing thoughts. Fox News played quietly. It was broadcasting footage of a presidential rally somewhere in the south. Hamoud watched, half transfixed, half appalled. The president had a kind of rictus grin and was rambling so incoherently that Hamoud simply could not follow his line of thought, if indeed he had one. The audience didn't appear to share Hamoud's lack of comprehension. They cheered. They waved American flags. They held banners aloft with the president's name and his jingoistic slogans. They punched clenched fists in the air. The audience, more than the president, interested Hamoud. There were only white faces. The camera didn't settle on a single person with brown skin. Each time the crowd roared its approval, he felt unnerved. He imagined himself among those people. Would he feel safe? He would not. Rabia came out of the bathroom wearing a robe, her hair wrapped in a towel. She checked on the children through the interconnecting door, then sat on the edge of the bed next to Hamoud and stroked his hair. I don't know why you watch that man on television, she said. Look how popular he is, Hamoud said. Look how they cheer for him. Maybe if that's what it is to be an American, we should listen to what he says. No said the rabbi. He won't be president forever, even if he would like to be. When he's gone, things will change. It doesn't feel like things will change, Hamoud said. You've seen how people look at us. They don't trust us. They think our children will grow up into terrorists. Then we will show them that we are good people, said Rabia. that our children are good people. She was right, as always and he smiled at her. I think, he said, when we get back home, I would like to find some work. I think I'm ready. Now it was her turn to smile, one of those smiles that was almost a cry. She squeezed his hand and then went to look out of the window. On the television he saw two adoring members of the crowd hold up a banner which said, POTUS FOREVER. The president smirked and nodded. Hamoud switched the television off. 1945 hours. Lightning flashed over the skyline of Washington, D.C. Thunder cracked and the rain lashed down. Lines of headlamps and brake lights glowed hazily through the elements. There were no pedestrians on the sidewalks. It was the kind of rain that made it difficult to breathe. Danny followed the general's directions, which took them to the heart of the capital. They queued over the Potomac River, where the water seethed and shone with each fork of lightning. Jefferson Memorial, the general said, pointing out an illuminated domed building with classical columns. We don't need a full sightseeing tour, Danny said. Just get us to the thing. Danny's curt response didn't stop the general pointing to the right a few minutes later. United States Capitol, he said. Danny looked at the huge, impressive building, lit up in the darkness, the illuminations burning through the thick curtain of rain. A couple of minutes later, the general pointed ahead and to the left. You know what that is, he said. It was the first time Danny had ever been to Washington, D.C., and so it was the first time he had seen the White House in person. The atmosphere seemed to boil around and above it. A double fork of lightning streaked the sky, framing the White House on either side, and Danny couldn't help a hot sensation of bile rising in his throat. He wondered how many operations he'd been involved with had been discussed in that building, how many men had been sent into action and to their deaths. He thought of the Zero Twenty Two team, and the taste of bile grew more bitter. He could just make out the American flag perched atop the White House and the muscles in his face pinched. He suppressed a fantasy of breaking into the place, finding his way to the Oval Office and letting the President have it. That would be an impossibility, even for him. 
His only option was to help the general release the deep fakes, and quickly. Where's the memory stick? he said, and before the general had time to refuse to tell him again, he added, We're here now. We've got you into the country. We've got you into D.C. We can't fuck around any more. The general was also staring at the White House. He didn't take his eyes away from it as he spoke. I have a lady friend, he said. I keep an apartment for her downtown, on the QT, you understand. It wouldn't be seemly for a man in my position to be involved in any kind of indiscretion. If he was aware of the ridiculousness of his comment, given what had happened with Bethany and Amman, he didn't show it. I hid the memory stick at her apartment. Danny felt himself deflating. How stupid was this guy? You are some random bit on the side to look after the most important intelligence object in the world right now, he demanded, incredulous. How the hell do you know you can trust her? She doesn't know I hid it there, the general said. I didn't tell her anything about it. What if she finds it? She won't. She won't even be there tonight. She works in New York during the week, flies back weekends. The apartment will be empty. You hope. I know. Danny gave that a moment's consideration. Tell me about the apartment, he said. What do you want to know? What kind of building? Terrace townhouses, four stories. The apartment's on the second floor. Entrances, exits, one entrance. There's a fire window at the back with an external staircase. Don't think it's ever been used, at least not since I bought the place. Is there a concierge? No. Do you have a key? Don't need one. Smart entry system. There are access keypads at the entrances to the building and the apartment. Are you known there? Will people recognize you? They'd recognize me if they saw me, I guess. I go in and out late nights and early mornings. I don't think anybody knows I'm a regular. Where can we leave the car? Out front, if there's a space, otherwise a parking lot a couple of blocks away. Danny thought his way through this information. He didn't like it much. A second-floor domestic apartment with only one entrance and one exit. If anybody was expecting them, it would be simple to surround the place. A couple of guys on the floor above, a couple on the floor below, mark the entrance and the exit, eyes on the street to see them approaching. If Danny had a team of his own, he could establish some countermeasures, but he didn't. It was just the three of them. And it didn't matter that the general thought his liaisons with his mistress were discreet. If Danny knew the intelligence community, and he did, they would be fully aware of O'Brien's supposedly secret trysts. They would know about his apartment, what time he tended to arrive and leave. They might even have surveillance equipment installed in the walls and other hidden places. If they had even the slightest suspicion that the general was still alive, the vaguest notion that he had re-entered the country, the three of them could be heading straight into a death trap. Stop! It was Bethany. Her voice was a shocked whisper. They were driving along a street lined with shops. Pull in, she said. Back up. What the? Do it, Danny. I think I just saw something. You need to see it too. The road was busy. Danny earned himself some angry beeps as he put two wheels up onto the sidewalk and reversed several metres past a drugstore and a McDonald's. He came to a halt in front of a TV shop. There were several large screens in the window. Had there been any smaller, the rain lashing against the glass would have completely obscured them, but they were huge, and they all displayed the same image. Danny and Bethany in the clothes they were wearing in Amman. Their faces looked grim and purposeful. It would not be obvious to anybody looking at the image for the first time, but Danny could immediately see that this was footage that had been taken as they strode along the corridor of the General's Hotel. How oh, the hell, the General started to say, the hotel's CCTV, Danny said. Your people have hacked it, or they've lent on the Jordanians, one or the other. The picture disappeared. The newsreel moved on. Danny silently pulled out into the traffic again. He felt sick. He tried to work out what it meant. 
were they reporting that the Brits had launched an op to assassinate the general? The president's Wagner group contacts would have seen Danny and Bethany leave with him. They would be wondering who they were and what they were doing. My bet is the president's people want to know why we didn't go through with our op to take you out, Danny said. They want to know what you said to us to make us change our mind. I didn't say anything. They don't know that. He frowned. The question is, do they think you're dead? If they do, why are they looking for me and Bethany? And if they don't, will they have someone waiting for us at your apartment? Nobody knows about that apartment, the general said, his voice testy. Danny gave him a sidelong, don't be so naive look. The general fell silent. A muscle twitched in his jaw as he clenched his teeth. If the media controlled by the president is circulating that footage on the news networks, it means they're very nervous, Danny said. They're going to make sure their hit happens quickly, he inhaled. I don't like this, he said. Every military instinct tells me we should hold off, put in some surveillance on your apartment, but I don't think we have time. I think we have to deal with whatever comes, and Bethany and I need to make sure nobody sees our faces. They drove in silence for a moment. Then the general said, We're about 45 minutes away. The television was on mute. Rabia was in the children's room getting them ready. Hamud could hear her kind cajoling, and it made him smile. He crossed the room to join them, but the picture on the television screen made him stop. An eight o'clock news bulletin showed a slightly blurred CCTV image of a man and a woman. The man had dark hair and dark features. He wore a suit that looked a little small for him across the shoulders. The woman had blonde hair and a dark jacket. There was something about them that made Hamoud stare, a sharpness in the eyes, a ruthlessness. A caption across the bottom of the screen read, American troops killed in Amman, Jordan, footage of suspects released. Hamoud felt a chill as he looked at them. He didn't really know what a killer was supposed to look like, even though the American authorities had accused him of being one. But if he had to guess, he imagined they might look like these two. He caught himself. What a terrible assumption he had just made, judging somebody on their appearance. Others did that to him all the time. Perhaps these two people were completely innocent, like Hamoud had been completely innocent, like so many others at Guantanamo had been completely innocent. He thought of his box of newspaper clippings back home, with pictures of other inmates he had never met. How many of them had been falsely accused? But, he told himself, the news networks must have a reason for broadcasting such an accusation against this man and this woman. Perhaps Hamoud was being too sensitive. Perhaps they really were bad guys. The newsreel moved on. Hamoud switched off the television and put the image from his mind. He was determined to have a pleasant evening with his family. It was a warm, clear Florida night. The buses that took people from the resort hotels to the park were packed full. Hamoud's children gripped his hands tightly. He could tell that they felt claustrophobic, pressed in on all sides by the other passengers. There was not so little room, however, that those around Hamoud couldn't manage to put a little space between them and him, especially when they caught sight of his beard and vivid scar. Hamoud gave both his children a little reassuring squeeze. He hoped they would not realise that he felt the same as they did. Sweat dripped down his back. His mouth was dry. He held his breath. Then the bus spat them all out at the turnstiles, and he could breathe easily. The children were more relaxed too. Hamud and Rabia ushered them into the park and towards the now familiar site of Main Street. It glowed with activity. There was a juggler who twirled luminous batons high into the air. Mickey, Donald and Goofy were enthusiastically greeting children as they passed. The Cinderella castle dominated everything, its spires glowing. Rabia stopped him for a moment and pointed at it. This, she said, 
This is America, not that awful man and his awful rallies. She was right, of course. She always was. They walked through the castle and on to the main drag. Here it was even busier. An enormous carnival float made its way slowly towards them. The characters, more than Hamud could even recognise, stood on the float, waving and dancing. There was a full brass band with trumpets and trombones and an enormous bass drum with a picture of Mickey Mouse on the skin. Young women with twirling batons and epaulettes marched glamorously in front of the float and everyone cheered and waved as it passed. Rabia and the children waved too and he felt a sudden and indescribable surge of happiness. It took him by surprise. He looked around and realised that, for the first time in ages, he felt like he was living in the moment, like he was part of something. He started to wave at the float. He grinned. He even shuffled from one foot to the other in time with the music. His children laughed delightedly to see it, though he couldn't hear them because the music was so loud. They danced with him and waved at the float with two hands, and Hamud didn't even stop dancing when he saw a woman dressed as Snow White taking photographs of people in the crowd. She was taking photographs of everyone. So what did it matter that as the float had almost passed, she stood at the edge, looked back and scanned the crowd as though searching for someone in particular? What did it matter that as her gaze fell directly on Hamud... There seemed to be a flicker of recognition. That a look of intense concentration replaced that of vacuous jollity as she raised her camera and took his picture, lowered it again and waved at him with a big cheesy grin and then was gone. Hamud was breathless. He was excited. He felt like a new person. "'What shall we go on first? he said, speaking loudly because the noise of the brass band hadn't faded away yet. The children shouted a barrage of incomprehensible suggestions and Hamud laughed again and took them by the hands and led them up Main Street, with Rabia also laughing by his side. And then he saw him, and he stopped. The man with the strange long face was standing on the opposite side of the road, outside a souvenir shop. Three young girls with blonde ringlets were standing to one side of him, clutching cuddly Minnie Mouse toys. He was wearing the same baseball jacket that looked just a little too big for him, and he was distractedly touching his cheeks. Was he nervous? He certainly appeared to be. One of the Minnie Mouse girls bumped into him and giggled. He gave her a look of such fury that Hamud was shocked. Frowning, the man turned and stormed away, disappearing into the crowd. All Hamud's joy drained out of him. He felt a crushing sense of impending doom. Who was that man? How did he know him? Because he did know him. He was certain of it. The children had noticed his sudden change of demeanour. They looked up at him wide-eyed. Rabia gently touched his arm. This way, he said. He pushed through the crowd, his family close behind him, heading in the direction he had seen the man storm away. He caught a glimpse of Donald Duck on the back of the man's baseball jacket. Then he lost sight of it again. He picked up his pace and continued to follow. Twenty, thirty hours. The SUV was stationary. At the General's instruction, Danny had parked it on a quiet street. It was lined with yellow street lamps. They beamed geometrical shapes of light into the heavy rain that hammered onto the roof of the vehicle and sluiced over the windscreen. They sat in the darkness, barely able to see out. Shadows flitted past on the sidewalk, hunched under umbrellas or wrapped in heavy raincoats. Across the street, a line of four-storey terraced townhouses loomed above them. Danny couldn't make out the roof line or the doorway through the rain, just the window glow of the rooms that had lights on inside. The car windows were misting up. The general cleared his with one hand. His skin squeaked across the wet glass. He pointed to the house directly adjacent to them. This is it, he said, the one with the black door. Danny couldn't make out the colour of the door nor any other feature of the house. It was in complete darkness. 
There was no lamp post in front of it, no lights on in the windows. He strategized. If he were putting in surveillance on this place, where would he do it from? Easy. He would set up an OP on the roof of the townhouse opposite. In weather like this, nobody would look up, nor expect anybody to be out in the elements. But he knew how the average surveillance guy thought. They were not regiment trained, willing to endure any amount of physical discomfort in order to get the job done. They would take the easier option, which would be to set up behind one of the windows of the building opposite. Danny wiped away the condensation on his side of the car and examined that building. He observed that each floor had a light on, but if there was surveillance on any of those floors, they would keep all the lights off in case they unexpectedly had to move into another room. Wait here, he told the others. He stowed his sig, raised his hood and exited the vehicle. The rain soaked him to the skin in seconds. He strode twenty metres along the sidewalk, head down, checking out the other vehicles parked on either side of the road. He was looking for something that stood out as a surveillance vehicle. A van, marked or unmarked, even a larger car with blacked-out windows. He saw nothing suspicious, so he turned 180 and walked back past the SUV and 20 metres in the other direction. Still nothing. He returned to the others and sat behind the wheel again. His clothes were cold and clammy. Rainwater dripped from them onto the seat and floor. There was another fork of lightning. As it flashed, Danny saw Bethany's face reflected in the rear-view mirror. It was pale, almost gaunt. She looked more tense than he'd ever seen her. I'm going in by myself, Danny said. I can move quicker and more quietly alone, and if something goes wrong it means you have another chance to retrieve the memory stick. Once I get into your apartment I'll check it's empty. I'll turn on a light overlooking the road for five seconds if everything's clear. If you haven't heard from me in ten minutes, you need to get the hell out of here. I'll leave the fob with you. Any questions? I guess I should tell you where the memory stick is, the general said. Damn right, Danny said. It's taped to the underside of a unit in the kitchen. You'll find it quicker than me, Danny said. Get up as quickly as you can when I give you the all clear sign. What are the access codes for the flat? The general told Danny the codes. Apartment three, he said. Danny nodded. Ten minutes. He reminded them, no longer. He stepped out into the rain again, looked left and right. There were no pedestrians, still no sign of surveillance. He crossed the road quickly and approached the front door of the general's house. He was weirdly reminded by the black paint, the brass fittings and the ornate detailing above the frame of the door of number 10 Downing Street, which he'd only ever seen on television. To the right, there was a keypad. He entered the numeric code the general had given him. The door clicked. He gently opened it just an inch, drawing his sig at the same time. He waited, listened through the torrential rain, tried to discern any other sound behind the door. There was nothing. He kicked the door open, gripping his weapon two-handed, entered. He was in a tiny hallway. To his left, four locked cubbyholes for mail. Straight ahead, a door with a brass one plaque. Ahead and to the right, a carpeted staircase winding steeply into gloom. He closed the door, allowed himself a few seconds for his eyes to grow accustomed to the dark. Water dripped from his clothes onto the stone floor, not ideal. It meant his presence could be detected, but as long as he was aware of that, he could take steps to mitigate the risk. He moved across the hallway to the staircase, aimed the sig up and at an angle, searched the gloom for shadows and movement. Nothing. He advanced. The stairs were steep, the treads shallow. He trod lightly but couldn't help them creaking as he walked. His hyper-acute senses amplified each creak. He stopped at the first landing. Breathed. Scanned tried to listen beyond the thumping of his heart, kept his weapon raised, his finger on the trigger, noted the door on his right with a brass number two, advanced again. The next set of stairs creaked louder than the first. 
Every sound seemed exaggerated in the silence of the stairwell. He paused after each step, checking ahead of him and behind him. There was no sign of anything or anyone. The second landing was almost identical to the first. The only noticeable difference was the number on the door of the apartment. Three. He approached the door, listened hard, heard nothing. He removed his shoes to keep his footfall silent, felt for the keypad with his left hand, gripping the sig with his right, keyed in the code, opened the door just a couple of inches, listened, stepped inside. He closed the door behind him and stood for a moment in the darkness. He was in a square entrance hall, three doors leading left, right and straight ahead, all shut a posh high-backed armchair in one corner, an occasional table with an internet router, two green lights glowing, and a vase of tall flowers that emitted a pungent floral odour. He couldn't make out the flower heads in the darkness, but the smell suggested they were past their best, evidence that nobody had been here for a couple of days. There was something else on the table, but he couldn't quite make it out. No sign of any break-in. Absolute stillness. Danny raised his sig, breathed slowly and deeply to control his pulse. Somewhere at the edge of his senses, he could hear distant traffic, but nothing else. He stepped towards the table, his feet making no sound. The other object on the table was an antique mahogany letter-writing set. Next to it was a silver letter-opening knife, blunt but pointed. And there was something else. On the edge of the table was a circular mark where somebody had placed a glass, or more likely a bottle, of water. Danny touched it. The ring was wet. Fresh. Someone was in here. He was certain of it. And he would be waiting for Danny behind one of three doors. Question was, which one? Thunder cracked outside so loud that the house seemed to shake with it. Danny analysed the layout. The window looking out onto the street where Bethany and the general were waiting would be through the door to his left. That meant the room with the rear fire exit would be to his right. Perhaps the door opposite the main entrance led to a bedroom or bathroom. If Danny was lying in wait for someone, he would definitely choose the room with an extra exit. Basic tradecraft. But would his guy think the same way? The sound of a toilet flushing answered that question for him. It came from the room Danny had identified as the bedroom, and he knew the door would open any moment. He didn't want to fire his weapon, not if he could help it. It was not suppressed, and the sound could bring people running. He grabbed the silver paper knife in his right hand and moved over to the door. He stood to the right of the doorframe, back to the wall, Sig now in his pocket. There was another crack of thunder. He waited. Five seconds passed. The door opened. A figure appeared. He was taller and broader than Danny, which was unusual. He had a handgun in his belt, but was still doing up his fly. He didn't see Danny until it was too late. Danny's strategy was to hit him hard and fast, not too much of a swing, because that would waste precious seconds, and he knew he could achieve the power and momentum he wanted without it. He grabbed the man's neck with his left hand and drove the tip of the paper knife into the bottom of his skull. The knife sank halfway up to the hilt before the tip hit something hard and grisly. He gave it a good wriggle and felt the man's legs collapse beneath him. Danny eased him down to the ground, one hand still on the hilt of the knife. There wasn't much blood. Each time the knife moved position, the guy's legs flickered uncontrollably. Once he was on the ground, Danny kept wriggling the knife until the nerve movement stopped, and the dead man was completely still. Silence. Danny straightened up and drew his sig. He checked the flat. The bedroom had a lingering smell of perfume and a neatly made double bed with lots of cushions. An ensuite bathroom was filled with cosmetics, but nobody was hiding there. The door to the right of the main entrance was a sitting room, sofa and more armchairs, a TV, various cabinets, a wide window with a sturdy locking mechanism. 
no people. The third room off the hallway, overlooking the road, was a large eat-in kitchen and empty. He switched on the lights for five seconds, then returned to the hallway. He retrieved his shoes, put them on, and waited by the slumped corpse of the man he'd killed, weapon raised. Thunder cracked. The lights flickered off and back on again. Danny shivered. His wet clothes were bringing down his body temperature. He ignored it. It took them two minutes to arrive. The general's face went pale when he saw the dead man on the floor. Bethany barely seemed to notice him. She calmly closed the door behind them as the general led them into the kitchen. There were no curtains and Danny didn't like being illuminated. He took up position to the side of the window and half watched the road, half watched the general as he removed the kickboard below a line of kitchen units and felt underneath. A moment later, he heard the rip of tape. Let's get out of here, Danny said. You kidding me? We gotta broadcast this stuff now. This place is under surveillance. It'll only take a minute, the general said. I keep a Chromebook in the other room. Come on, let's get this done. Danny hesitated. He felt uneasy, but maybe the general was right. The sooner he could broadcast the deep fakes, the better their chance of stopping the hit. He nodded. I need to use the bathroom while you gentlemen save the world, Bethany said. Danny understood that she was seeking his permission, and he nodded. She left the room, then Danny and the general crossed the hallway, past the dead body with the knife still protruding from the back of his neck, and into the room opposite. The general switched on the light and moved over to a desk against the far wall. There was a mirror over the desk. As the general located a laptop in one of the drawers, Danny looked at his own reflection. Several days stubble, black bags under his eyes. He looked like he needed to sleep for a week. The general opened up his computer and sat in front of it at the desk, switched it on, inserted the memory stick. You gotta see this, he said. There were two video files on the memory stick. The general clicked on the first. Footage ran. Danny crouched down to watch it. The footage was completely unremarkable. It appeared to have been taken by a surveillance camera in a busy street. Danny could tell from the U.S. registration plates on the passing cars that it was an American street, but Danny didn't know the registrations well enough to identify which state it was in. The surveillance camera pointed across the road to a stretch of sidewalk where there was a fast food joint, a thrift store and a massage parlour, clearly not the best part of town. A man stood outside the massage parlour, a white guy, perhaps in his mid-thirties, he stood there for twenty seconds or so as other pedestrians passed by without looking at him. Then somebody approached, a woman, also white, dark shoulder-length hair. They spoke for perhaps thirty seconds, then shook hands. The woman walked away. The man remained outside the massage parlour for a few more seconds, then walked off in the opposite direction. The footage stopped. The general clicked on the second file. The same piece of footage ran, the same street, the same cars, the same angle on to the same shops. But the man was different, at least his face was, brown skin, an Arab-style beard, and a peculiar distinctive feature, a scar that started above his right eye and extended vertically over the eyelid and down onto his cheek. Danny knew that he was watching a deep fake. He knew to expect authenticity, but he was astonished at how lifelike it was. If he hadn't seen the original footage, there was simply no way he would have guessed that this had been doctored. It was completely convincing. The woman approached. The same woman, only not. This face was also different, older with highlighted hair. Danny thought he perhaps recognised her from TV, maybe. Then he had to remind himself that he was not watching a real person. He was watching a lie. Whoever it was that he was supposed to recognise, she had not walked up to this man with the strained scar on his eye. She had not spoken to him. She had not shaken his hand before walking away. The event unfolding on the screen simply had not happened. But nobody watching it would believe that if they hadn't seen the original first. The footage stopped running. There was silence. 
The woman on the deep fake is Madeline Doherty, or at least that's what we're supposed to believe, the general said. Democratic congresswoman, chair of various select committees, frontrunner for the Democratic nomination. She has a strong following among the black and Hispanic communities. Makes her the president's biggest threat come election time. What about the bloke with the huge scar on his eye? Danny said. I haven't been able to find out, but whoever he is, he's being set up by the CIA probably, or at least a faction within it. They have a unit, you know? Its sole purpose is to target jihadist sympathizers who wouldn't ordinarily be a credible threat and encourage them to cross the line and plot actual terror attacks. They let them get 90% of the way, then they pass the intel on to the feds to make the arrest and everybody's happy. You think that's what's happening to him? You think he's been encouraged to carry out an attack? Maybe. There's another possibility, though. The attacker could be somebody else. They might be making sure this guy is on the scene when it happens. They'll want a scapegoat, and a living whipping boy's better than a dead one, right? This guy sure looks the part with the beard and the eye and all. The president's base, there'll be a pack of wolves over a hunk of raw steak if they think a guy like that is involved in a terror attack. And if they think the liberals have been fraternizing with him, he'll be able to spin whatever the hell he wants. We'll never be rid of the guy. So let's stop him, Danny said. He felt faintly sick. I've already set up a YouTube account, the general said, and a mailing list with the news chiefs of all the major networks. I'll distribute the footage, then make some calls. There should be time to get me onto the late bulletins. The White House machine will get straight into motion. The story will lead the news cycle in the morning. I'll be discredited by lunchtime, but by then... The Oval Office and the Kremlin will be sufficiently spooked not to try this line of attack again. His fingers hesitated over the keyboard. Danny felt a moment of profound respect for him. For all his faults and foolishness, he was a good man, doing the right thing, despite the personal consequences. Thunder rolled overhead. The lights in the apartment flickered off, then on. There was a flash of lightning. Let's do it now, the general muttered, and he opened up a web browser. It was the last thing he ever did. Chapter 24 If he hadn't crouched down to watch the footage on the general's laptop, perhaps Danny would have seen Bethany earlier. As it was, he stood up just in time to see her reflection in the mirror. She was standing just a couple of metres behind them. Both her arms were extended. She held a pistol, a Glock 17, two-handed, right forefinger on the trigger. She must have taken it from the belt of the dead man in the hallway. It was aimed directly at the back of the general's head, and she was close enough for an accurate pistol shot. Everything happened in an instant. Bethany released a single round. It slammed into the general's skull. The general slumped heavily onto his laptop as a spatter of blood and scorched hair spat from the entry wound. Danny reached for his own weapon, but saw in the mirror that Bethany had immediately turned her glock on him, and he half expected to hear the shot that would kill him. Instead, he heard her voice. Hands up, Danny. Let's not make a mistake. He raised his hands. The general's laptop was quietly beeping due to his face pressing down on the keys. Blood seeped from the wound. It dripped down the side of his head and onto the desk. Danny watched Bethany in the mirror. She was completely in control. Her arm didn't shake. Her expression didn't change. She spoke calmly. "'Here's what's going to happen,' she said." You're going to very slowly take your firearm and place it on the table. Then you're going to put your hands on the back of your head and you're going to walk over to the window. You do anything else, any sudden movements, you get what the general got. Understood? Bethany, understood? Danny didn't reply. He considered his options. Could he draw his weapon, turn and fire on Bethany before she had a chance to shoot? No way. Could he dive out of the way and hope to get the better of her in the confusion? Perhaps, but he wouldn't bet his life on it. 
And that was exactly what he'd have to do, bet his life. He had no option but to do as he was told. Very slowly, he lowered his hands, removed his weapon, and placed it on the table. The computer stopped beeping. Maybe the general's blood had seeped into the mechanism. He walked over to the window. Bethany kept the Glock trained directly at him. You think I'm stupid, she said as he moved. You know I don't think that, Danny said. Then why do you behave like it? I don't know what you mean. He glanced over at the general's body. Why did you do that? That's my job, isn't it? That's why I'm here. Oh, no, plans have changed, haven't they? You don't need the crazy psycho bitch to do your dirty work for you anymore. So why am I here, Danny? What possible reason could your people have for sending me into the US with you and... She inclined her head distastefully in the direction of the dead general. Him. Danny said nothing. He could feel his heart beating. He cursed himself silently for leaving the dead man's Glock in his belt where Bethany could swipe it, for taking his eye off her at the critical moment, and for underestimating her, for failing to realise that she would work out the real reason she had been told to accompany him on this part of the mission. When were you going to do it, Danny? she whispered. When you'd finished saving the world. Put a bullet in the head of the stupid woman, then have a good laugh about it with your new friend, the general. You've got it wrong, Danny said. Put the pistol down. We need to get out of here. Someone will have heard the gunshot. They'll have called the police. Shut up, she hissed. Don't patronise me. She edged towards the laptop. She released one of her hands and pulled the memory stick from the side of the computer, put it in her pocket. What are you doing? Danny said. What does it look like? It looks like you're taking the evidence. Bethany, there's going to be a hit. You know that. We can stop it. I'm not taking evidence, Bethany said. I'm ensuring my son continues to have a mother. Your people want this footage. They'll need to deliver my son and guarantee our safety, Bethany. Don't insult me! She snapped. Don't tell me you had no plans to kill me when this was over. Don't tell me that's not what they told you to do. I know how they work. I know how you work. She moved her free hand back up to the weapon. Danny judged the distance between them, five metres. An unskilled shooter could easily miss at that range, but he knew she'd had weapons training. She was likely to hit him. You're wrong. We can sort this. You think I'm mad? she said. Danny shook his head. I'll tell you what madness is, she continued. Madness is performing the same action and expecting a different result. I let you go once before and you turned up again like a bad penny. I'm not crazy, so I won't be doing that again. Put the gun down, Bethany, Danny started to say, but he knew there was no point. He could tell when somebody had made the decision to kill. There was a unique flatness in the eyes. She was going to do it. Bethany, I can sort things for you. Don't lie to me. If you shoot me now, Danny said, you make it harder to see your son again, not easier. I can make it happen, Bethany. You know I can. There was, for the briefest instant, a flicker of doubt. She glanced at the general and bit her lower lip, as though pondering whether she'd made a mistake. But she didn't lower the weapon. Her hands didn't tremble, and when she looked back at Danny, he sensed that her determination had doubled. He felt a sickening ball of heat in his stomach. She looked like she was going to do it. Somewhere outside the building there was the sound of a police siren. Bethany's lip curled contemptuously, but she glanced sidelong, clearly registering the siren. "'Sounds like someone's already phoned in the sound of gunshot, Bethany.' Danny said carefully. The police are on their way, and chances are they'll be putting in a cordon on the roads round the apartment. Our faces are all over the news networks. We don't know what instructions they've been given if they see us. If you want to see your son again, you need to stick with me. I'm your best way out of this. You make me sick, Bethany spat. I don't need your help. 
There was another roll of thunder that caused the lights in the apartment to flicker momentarily. Danny grabbed his chance. He dived to the ground in the half-second of darkness. He heard the retort of the glock and the familiar splintering sound of bullet against glass. He rolled behind the cover of a sofa as the lights returned. He heard Bethany hiss with frustration and prepared himself for her to appear and take a second shot. But she didn't. He heard her footsteps as she sprinted out of the apartment. Had the siren spooked her? He didn't know and didn't have time to think about it. He pushed himself to his feet, ran to the table to grab his cig. He was no stranger to death, but the sight of the general slumped and bleeding over his laptop angered him. A good man trying to do the right thing, and Danny had let him down. He sprinted from the apartment. On the landing, he took a second to consider whether Bethany would have gone upstairs. He decided not. In two minutes, this place would be full of police. She knew that. She wouldn't risk it. He hurtled down the stairs, his feet thumping heavily on the treads, as he took them four at a time. The front door to the house was open. The rain was still falling heavily. It stung his face. He looked left and right. No sign of her. But to the left, neon lights, sirens. Would Bethany have run that way to double bluff him? No. She was too careful. The risk was too high, especially when she was holding the gun that had just committed a murder and her face had been on national TV. She had turned right. He was certain of it. He sprinted after her. He tried to calculate how far ahead of him she would be. He estimated he had left the apartment 20 seconds after her. He was fitter and probably faster. A hundred metres? He peered ahead through the rain as he ran. Visibility was poor. He couldn't see her. He upped his pace, half closing his eyes to stop the rainwater blinding him. The sirens were screaming behind him. His feet slapped against the wet path. He kept looking straight ahead. He could see a street crossing, one at right angles. Distance, 75 metres, and in the yellow light of a street lamp, which illuminated the rain pelting at an oblique angle, he saw a figure turning the corner to the right, a small frame, a glimpse of blonde hair. It was her. Rain, everywhere, in his mouth, down his neck. It saturated every thread of his clothes. It seeped in between his palm and the handle of his cig. He wiped it from his eyes with a soaking sleeve as he reached the corner and turned right. It was another residential street, almost indistinguishable from the last. Townhouses loomed on either side, parked cars lined the road, and there was the flashing neon of police lights too. Danny had been right about the cordon. They blocked the road, 150 metres distant. Danny scanned through the rain and the glare, searching for Bethany. There was no sign of her, but she couldn't have simply disappeared. She would be avoiding the police lights. She would be hiding somewhere between his position and theirs. He slowed to a jog, advanced along the street, scanning left and right. He didn't really think she would be hiding between parked cars or in the porch of a townhouse. Too easy to see, but he checked those locations anyway. No sign of her. The flashing lights didn't move. The police vehicles were stationary at the end of the road, Twenty metres ahead, Danny saw a side street leading off to the right, more of an alleyway, really, narrow, no more than six metres wide. He put himself into Bethany's head, police in front of her, Danny behind, no other place to hide. She wouldn't know if the alleyway had an exit, but it looked like her only option. He stopped at the corner by the black railings in front of the end of terrace, listened through the pounding rain, raised his weapon two-handed, turned. She was there, fifty metres away. She wasn't running. Perhaps she had realised that he would catch up with her eventually. But Danny didn't understand what she was doing. There was a high brick wall on either side of the narrow alleyway. There seemed to be an exit route at the far end, but the rain was too heavy for him to see it clearly. Bethany herself was crouching on the ground to the left-hand side of the alleyway. The slope of the road was such that a rush of rainwater was streaming towards her. She seemed to have one hand in the stream. She held her gun in the other and was pointing back down the alleyway towards Danny. There was no way she could fire reliably from that distance. Danny advanced, his own weapon raised. There was a clap of thunder, then another flash of lightning. It illuminated the wet hair plastered to her pale face. Even from a distance, she looked desperate, crazed. Distance to Bethany, twenty metres. Fifteen. What was she doing? Why was she crouching there? Ten metres, and Danny understood. The stream of rainwater was gushing into a drainage grate. He could now see that Bethany was holding the memory stick over it, ready to drop it. And if Danny took her out, her grip would immediately loosen and it would be lost. Stalemate. 
rainwater streamed down Bethany's face. Danny couldn't be certain that there weren't also tears. They stood in silence, weapons pointed at each other for a full thirty seconds. Danny knew he had to choose his words with great care. He had to talk around. He had to be persuasive. He took a single step towards her. Don't move! she screamed. He froze, kept his weapon raised, evaluated his position. He knew she was right-handed. She was holding her weapon in her left hand. She was in a heightened state of emotion. Her chances of an accurate shot at this distance were low. His chances were pretty high. How far would the sound of gunshot travel? With the cacophony of the rain pelting the ground and the rooftops, not far. We can sort this out, he shouted over the hammering of the rain. Put the weapon down. Give me the memory stick. She shook her head. He saw that she was shivering. If you don't put the weapon down, this only ends one way, he shouted. Work with me. I can get you out of here. Another shake of the head. We can deal with the general, he shouted. We can say he was killed by the guy waiting for us in the apartment. They'll believe me even if they don't believe you. We can fix it. He risked another step. I said, don't move! Bethany screamed. She waved the weapon threateningly and put her fingers into the gaps in the grate so the memory stick was out of sight. I want to speak to my son, she shouted. I want to see him. Get him on the phone. Otherwise, this footage is gone. Danny didn't move. Don't you understand me? Bethany shouted. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about this footage. I don't care about the terror attack. I don't care about you. I just care about my son, and I want to speak to him right now. Danny heard sirens, a glimpse of blue neon as a police car passed the opening to the alleyway 40 metres behind him. What are my options? He could continue trying to talk around, but she wasn't in the mood to be persuaded. Or he could do what she asked, get the kid on the phone. It would give him the opportunity to approach her, get close. And when he was close, he had a much better chance of overpowering her. Decision made. He released his left hand while keeping the sig raised in his right, felt inside his jacket for his phone. It told him that the time was 2100 hours. Beads of rain collected on the screen, making it unresponsive as he swiped. He had to try a few times, but he accessed his encrypted calling app and dialed the access number into Hereford before putting the phone to his ear. It rang. Bethany stared. He was sure that it wasn't just rainwater welling in her eyes. Go ahead. Get me the CO. Say again, the line is bad. Get me the damn CO. Wait out. The line went silent. Danny's focus moved to other sounds. The distant sirens, the boom of thunder, the rain fizzing all around him. Black! The CEO's voice sounded curt. What's happening? You're all over the fucking news networks. I need Bethany's kid. On the line. Right now. Video call. He judged the level of his voice carefully, clear enough to be heard over the line, not so loud that Bethany could hear him. Silence. Boss, did you hear me? I heard you. Black, I don't know why you're asking this, but it's not going to happen. It has to. Bethany has the memory stick with the footage. She's going to destroy it if she doesn't see her kid. More silence. You have to find another way, the CO said. A crack of thunder, a flash of lightning. It lit Bethany's face up again. There was a kind of hunger in her expression. She looked wild, desperate. There's no other way, Danny said. And he meant it. There has to be. Don't you get what I'm saying? The kid can't get on a call. It's impossible. His getting on a call days are done. He's dead. Danny could almost taste his revulsion. It was bitter and acrid. It made him sneer. How? The team that picked him up got heavy-handed. We couldn't tell you, not when he was all the leverage we had with her. You get that, right? Yeah, Danny got it. He got that he was on the side who would think nothing of using a dead kid to their advantage. He killed the call and lowered the phone. 
Well? Bethany demanded. Are they going to do it? Her voice was shaky. It had turned hoarse. Are, are they? Danny didn't know what it was that communicated the truth to her. The crease of his frown, perhaps. The self-loathing downturn of his mouth and eyes. Maybe it was the way he distractedly failed to raise his left hand up to his weapon again, as he should have done. Or maybe it was simply his silence, his inability to say anything, for fear of revealing the one fact he knew he had to conceal. All he knew was that she understood. She shook her head, the faintest shake, more of a twitch, as though she couldn't quite believe the truth that had just struck her. Her lips moved. Danny could tell what she was whispering to herself. Her child's name. She closed her eyes briefly. Danny experienced a curious sense of time slowing down. He saw raindrops splash in slow motion from her eyelashes. Then she opened her eyes again, and it was as if she was a different person. Everything about her had changed. She was not the Bethany White who had been on ops with him over the past days, ruthless, certainly, but calm and in absolute control. It was the Bethany White he had seen back at Bryce Norton, caged in the guarded porter cabin, raw aggression and fire. She screamed. It was pure emotion, and it cut through everything. The sirens, the rain. He could tell that instinct and fury had taken over her. He knew she was going to fire. He hit the ground just as she released her round, and as he dived and rolled on the wet pavement, he fired his sig. The two retorts followed each other in quick succession. It was only after Danny released his round that he felt a sting in his right arm and realised Bethany had clipped him. The impact had compromised his own ability to shoot straight. His round had hit her in the right forearm. She screamed again and pulled her arm up. The memory stick fell from her grasp into the grate washed away with the torrential flow of rainwater. Danny clasped one hand to the wound. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't good. It felt like there was some blood loss and the arm was shaky. Bethany was on her feet. Her own arm hung loosely by her side and rainwater washed off the blood that dripped onto her hand. She staggered back and fired again, but the bullet went loose. Danny didn't know where. She turned to run towards the far end of the alleyway. The exit was about 30 metres away, and so far there was no indication of a police presence there. Danny took another shot, but she was a moving target, and the graze on his arm affected his aim. He cursed as his own bullet missed his target. He steadied his hand, fired again, but Bethany was running fast at an angle from his line of fire, and she was beyond his effective range. He pushed himself to his feet, ready to chase her, but then he heard voices, and he looked back. Blue lights flashed at the entrance to the alleyway behind him, no doubt drawn to the sound of gunfire. Silhouetted figures moved in front of them, four, maybe five, armed. This was America, so yeah, armed. He couldn't tell what they were shouting through the noise of the rain, but he could guess. Decision time. The footage was lost. Bethany was gone. Those American police officers would be trigger-happy, especially if they recognised his face. He had to get out of there. He ran in the same direction as Bethany, towards the far end of the alleyway. Fast. Chapter 25 Five past nine, and the park was so busy. Much busier than during the day. Everyone was here for the fireworks at 9.15, and the streets were packed. It was difficult to move through the crowds, but Hamoud did it. Rabia and the children struggled to keep up. Every now and then he caught a glimpse of the man with the long face, or at least of his back and the Donald Duck baseball jacket. The sighting never lasted more than a few seconds before the crowds closed around him. Hamoud was aware of Rabia calling at him to slow down. He couldn't. He was drawn to this man, desperate to see his face again, desperate to identify it. Maybe it was someone from his past. He had to know. He stopped. He had reached the edge of a large circular fountain that blasted water twenty metres into the air, lit up by lights of all colours. On the far side was a set of steps leading up to a café, a crowd several people deep enclosed the fountain. Hamwood's children cupped the water in their hands and naughtily splashed each other. 
Rabia was giving him her concerned look. Hamud was staring over at the steps. The man with the long face was there. He was almost at the top, so he was visible above the crowd. He was scanning it, as though looking for someone. The baseball jacket really did look too big for him, and he was muttering to himself and absent-mindedly touching his face, as though he was somehow unfamiliar with it. Hamud blinked and realised what he was seeing. He was seeing a man unaccustomed to being clean-shaven, a man used to wearing a beard. That thought made Hamud touch his own beard, and it made him envision what the man with the long face would look like if he had one. And then, instantly, he knew. Hamud closed his eyes. He pictured himself back at home, sitting at the table, opening up the box of newspaper clippings that he kept on the top shelf of the bookcase and which Rabia wanted him to throw away. The clippings about former Guantanamo Bay prisoners, Hamoud had never met or even seen, but with whom he felt a connection. One of them was a man with a long face and a long beard. In his picture, he had looked friendly and appealing. Hamoud had found himself wondering if, in another life, they might have been friends. He opened his eyes, superimposed a beard on the man's face. It was him. There was no question. Only he didn't look friendly and appealing now. He looked nervous and dangerous. Nausea flooded through Hamwood's gut. He thought of the man and the woman who he'd seen on TV, how he'd told himself not to be too quick to judge, and he realised he had been misjudging the man in the clipping. Perhaps he was not innocent, like Hamwood. Perhaps his case was not a miscarriage of justice. And it was suddenly, strikingly, horribly clear to Hamoud why the man's jacket was oversized and why he had shaved his beard. He was absolutely certain that if he looked under the man's clothes, he would discover that he'd shaved his body hair too. He remembered the urban myth that had come to him the previous night that the fireworks coincided with a spike in gun crime nearby. Was that true? Perhaps not, but there was no doubt that the best time to set off an explosion was when everybody's attention was on the sky, not on those around them. The man walked down one step towards the fountain. He was still muttering to himself, as if praying. Why could nobody see what Hamud could see? Dizziness almost overpowered Hamud. He had to grip the edge of the fountain to stay upright. He couldn't hear anything. The people in the crowd were a blur, with the occasional face suddenly crystallising into absolute clarity. A young woman with a shaved head, a black man with his son on his shoulders, a couple of teenagers kissing, all of them unknowingly seconds from horror. Hamoud! Hamoud! His hearing returned. The excited buzz of the crowd and Rabia urgently saying his name and pulling at his sleeve. What's the matter? What's going on? You look... you look... Terrible! He stared at her. She had tears in her eyes. He looked down at his children. They had stopped playing with the water. They were watching him, their adorable eyes so wide. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. The free holiday. The people watching him, taking his photograph. He hadn't been imagining it. He wasn't paranoid. He was seeing things as they were. Hamoud had been manipulated into being in this very place at this very time. His presence was being documented, because then, when the horror happened, he would be the scapegoat, a former Guantanamo inmate, a man looking like him at the sight of a horrific terror attack, an accomplice to the crime. He thought of the presidential rally he had watched on TV, those white faces with their American flags and their fists punched in the air. Who among them would believe Hamoud was not involved? Not a single one. He was the perfect suspect, oven ready. And would they believe him when he declared that he had been set up? Of course they wouldn't. A dead suicide bomber would soon be forgotten, but a live accomplice dragged through a sensational trial and awarded a lifelong prison term or even a death sentence. Hamoud would become a symbol, a focus for their bile. 
living, breathing proof that their hatred of outsiders was justified. Hamoud looked at his watch. Ten past nine. The fireworks would start in five minutes. He took Rabia's hand, held it between his. You have to go, he said. She frowned. Hamoud, no, Hamoud said. Do not talk. I beg you not to argue with me. Take the children and go now. Get out of the park. Get as far away from here as you can. Do not look back. Run if you can. Don't stop running, even to look at the fireworks, especially to look at the fireworks. He bent down to Malik and Melissa and embraced each of them with a fierce hug. Look after your mother, he said, and remember that I love you. He stood again. Now go. Rabia obviously understood his urgency. He was grateful that she didn't try to talk him round or tell him he was paranoid or unwell. He could see his own panic in her face. She took the children, one in each hand, and squeezed back through the crowd, earning some shouts and unkind comments from those whose good humour did not extend to letting through this brown woman and her children. For once, the comments didn't anger Hamud. For once, he was pleased that people didn't want to be too close to his family. It meant they passed through the crowd more quickly. They were out of his sight within seconds. Hamud moved just as quickly. He half considered jumping into the fountain and splashing across its diameter, which was only about 15 metres wide, and so was the most direct route to the steps. It was not a possibility, of course, to do that, would draw attention to himself, and that was the worst thing he could do. So he squeezed his way around the perimeter, ignoring the same comments and complaints that his family had received. He kept the man on the steps in his peripheral vision. Hamud didn't want him to see that he was under observation, nor did he want to lose sight of him. He saw the man take another step down towards the fountain. Classical music filled the air, a tune that Hamud recognised but couldn't identify. He knew what it meant, though. The firework display was about to start. He was sweating heavily. His palms were more irritated than they had ever been. He scratched them with his fingernails whenever he was not using his hands to clear a path around the fountain. The scratching brought no relief. It increased the irritation. By the time he had made a semicircle and was standing in front of the steps, his palms were burning. The sweat felt like blood. There was a heart-thumping series of bangs. Hamud felt them at his very core. He thought for a sickening moment that it had happened. Then the crowd oohed and aahed and the sky lit up. A multitude of different colours and the fireworks continued with their squeals and cracks and technicolour explosions. Hamud zoned it all out. He heard nothing but his heartbeat and the rise and fall of his lungs. And he focused in on the only other person in the vicinity whose eyes were not raised to heaven. The man with the long face was still scanning the crowd. He had reached the fountain and was looking across it. He was only four metres from where Hamoud was standing, and as a red firework burst overhead, Hamoud saw beads of sweat on his forehead reflecting the glow. Thanks to the curve of the circular fountain wall, Hamoud saw that he was muttering to himself. Although no lip-reader, he could make out what the man was saying. Hello, Akbar. Hello, Akbar. Hello, Akbar. Hamoud hesitated for a moment, but only for a moment. A moment in which he thought about his family, his children, how he knew that they would always bear the stigma of their father's imprisonment, how they would always be under suspicion, the children of a man everybody thought was a terrorist, even though he was not. But what if he could alter the story for them? What if, instead of being the children of a pariah, they grew up as the children of a hero? What if he gave them the one thing Hamwood had looked for but never found? A new life. He raised his eyes. The fireworks bloomed above him, and he felt for the first time since the camp serene. His palms had stopped itching. His breathing was steady. His heart beat at its usual rate. He kept gazing up, but edged around the perimeter of the fountain, keeping the man in view. His awareness had never felt so heightened. He saw and heard everyone and everything with complete clarity. An elderly couple, hand in hand. A baby cooing in a stroller. Twin girls, no more than ten years old, in identical outfits, all these people unaware of the threat in their midst. He was only two metres away now. The music swelled. The man with the long face turned so that his back was facing the fountain. 
Hamud realized what that meant. The blast would come from his front, and he didn't want the deserted area over the fountain to take the brunt of it. There was no point being a suicide bomber if you didn't take as many people with you as possible. Hamud could see his right hand. It was clenched, as though he was grasping something. The pad of his thumb was circling. It looked like he was preparing to press a button. Hamud took another step towards him. They were just a meter apart. The man with the long face closed his eyes. Hamud hesitated. He saw the crowd, a blanket of raised heads spread out around the fountain and far beyond it. He saw the sky, a riot of light and color and smoke. He saw from the corner of his eye the glowing fairy tale castle, and he made a wish that what he was about to do would make his children's dreams come true. And then he did it. Hamud stepped in front of the bomber, facing him. He wrapped his arms around the bomber's abdomen as tightly as if he was holding on to his own children. He was aware of a rapid sequence of firework explosions overhead and of someone shouting nearby and of the bomber roaring in frustration as Hamud forced them both over the edge of the fountain. He was aware of a splash as they hit the water and a muffled cry of anger as he twisted hard so that the bomber was lying face down in the water and Hamud was beneath him, face up, submerged. And then he was never aware of anything ever again. The fireworks were loud, but the explosion of the suicide bomber's homemade device was louder. The kind of deep boom that vibrates the core and deadens the hearing. The kind of shock that paralyzes the muscles and the senses for a few seconds until the panic starts. The panic started. There were screams, of course. They mingled with the fireworks and the classical music and were a catalyst for more screaming, which radiated through the crowd from the epicentre of the suicide bomber. Within seconds, people were screaming and running without knowing what they were screaming about or running from. Even the people in the vicinity of the steps could not know it all. Some of them, distracted from the firework display by the sudden movement, had seen Hamud grapple the bomber into the fountain. They had seen, as well as heard, the explosion. It was a sight that would remain with them as long as they lived. Hamud's body had taken the force of the blast. He could not absorb it all, of course. The force of the explosion had thrown the bomber himself up into the air in a shower of blood, water and shrapnel. Those closest to the blast were thrown outwards from it. Their skin burned, their hair scorched. A nail flew into the shoulder of the black man with the kid on his shoulders. Another pierced the leg of a young woman. Yet another blinded an old man in his left eye. But they could not know amid the panic and the chaos and the injury and the blood that the bulk of the shrapnel in the bomber's jacket had torn into the flesh of Hamud's thorax and abdomen. They saw dismembered body parts flying through the air and lying on the ground, mangled, wet, cauterized and smoking, and the sight revolted them. It revolted them not only because the limbs were gruesome to behold, but because they were the limbs of an extremist, a fanatic, a killer who wished harm on them and their families. But they could not know, as they gathered their weeping children into their arms, to protect them from the vision of these body parts, that the body parts floating in the fountain belonged to a man who had sacrificed himself to save them. They could smell the rank, acrid stench of burning flesh, and it made some of them sick. But they could not know, as the fireworks continued to flower in the sky and the music continued its inappropriate counterpoint to the screams, that a woman holding hands with her two children had suddenly stopped hurrying to the exit, and the sickness in her stomach was more profound than any of theirs. The screams had reached her ears. She closed her eyes. When she opened them again, there were tears and her children were looking up at her. She bent down to hug them, each in turn, and drew some comfort from the warmth of their bodies and the way they wrapped their little arms around her and held tight. Then she said, We must do what your father asked. She took them by the hand again and led them to the exit.
Chapter 26 For the first time that night, Danny was thankful for the rain. It offered cover from the police officers behind him, and he had to outrun them. The alleyway extended for another thirty metres. Danny sprinted along it, ignoring the pain in his right arm where Bethany's bullet had grazed him, his feet splashing heavily in the flood of water on the ground. The cops would be following forty metres distant, perhaps less. He didn't need to check behind him to be certain of that. If they got close enough, there was every chance that they would take a shot. Distance was essential. At the end of the alleyway, he could turn left or right. Both led to busy streets, with the hazy glare of car headlamps moving through the rain. There was nothing to choose between his two options. Bethany could have gone in either direction, but she was not his primary concern now. She no longer had the memory stick. The footage was lost. His attempt to stop the President's conspiracy had failed. He turned left at random and emerged soaked and panting onto the busy road. A police car screamed past. Danny pulled his wet hood further over his face and hurried in the opposite direction. There were still no pedestrians out in the rain. He was a lone figure as he pounded the path, and although his head was down and his weapon concealed, he knew he had to hide. The police were everywhere, and there were no crowds in which to lose himself. It was impossible to be the grey man when you were sprinting alone along deserted pathways. He soon came across a right-hand turn which led down a side street filled with large commercial rubbish bins. It was dark, dingy, unwelcoming, and stank of debris. The places nobody wanted to go were the perfect places to hide. He ducked down the lane and secreted himself behind one of the huge plastic bins. There was rotting litter on the ground and rain streaked down the wall behind him. He crouched in shadow, his wet clothing clinging to him, and removed his weapon ready should he need to use it. He listened hard through the rain. The distant sound of sirens came and went. He thought perhaps he heard the sound of voices shouting. But the rain washed away these fragments of sound, and Danny remained undisturbed and undiscovered. Defeat did not sit well with Danny Black. He had the mindset of a regiment man, a mindset that valued operational success at all costs. Bethany White had denied him that success, thwarted his operation. There was a part of him that wanted to hunt her down and finish the job the headshed had given him. Another part of him, however, felt as much anger with the headshed as with Bethany. They'd killed her boy. He hadn't deserved that, whatever his mother might have done. Danny didn't know what made him feel more bitter that he was in some way complicit in the death of a child, or that they'd kept him in the dark about it while he carried out their instructions. Either way, they'd been playing Danny as well as Bethany. He knew he shouldn't be surprised after all these years. He was just a soldier, after all, there to do a job and not to ask too many questions. But the headshed's deception had an unintended consequence. Despite everything, Danny felt a strange complicity with Bethany. He was not going to go looking for her. She could be anywhere in Washington, D.C. already, in any case. She was somebody else's problem now. The rain continued to fall. Danny stayed where he was. His body temperature was dropping. His arm was in pain. He was cramped and wet and uncomfortable. But... He could wait here, hidden in the darkness for as long as he needed, while the police moved on and he worked out his next move. Bethany White did not know where she was. She had run and run and run. Everything was a blur. She was clutching her right forearm with her left hand. There was blood and it hurt. But she didn't care about that. Rain streamed into her face. But she didn't care about that either. There had been tears for a while washed away by the downpour. But now there was just a hot, burning mass of pain in her chest. A desperation and an anger like she had never known. They had intended to take her life. She could cope with that. She could even understand it. But to take the one thing that meant more to her than that, she could never forgive them for it. She stopped running. She was breathing heavily. Her surroundings came into focus. She was outside a liquor store in a small street with barely any traffic. She had no phone and no money. 
but these things were not so hard to come by, especially if you had a Glock 17 in your fist. She looked through the window of the store. There was just one customer, a lanky young guy with a ponytail and a thin raincoat wet from the weather and slightly unsteady on his feet, buying beer. The cashier was putting the beers into a brown paper bag while the young guy placed some bills on the counter. Moments later, he was heading to the exit. Bethany could tell he was drunk. She gripped her handgun behind her back, checked to see that the street was empty, then stood to one side of the store and waited for him to step outside. The young man paused for a moment in the doorway, looking out at the rain with a bleary expression of distaste. Then he shrugged, stepped out into it, and walked in Bethany's direction. He didn't even appear to notice her until she was standing right in front of him, her weapon raised and inches from his chest. He stopped. His jaw dropped. "'Give me your cell phone!' Bethany said. He stared at the gun, then at Bethany. He shook his head, emboldened perhaps by the booze in his system, which she could smell. She didn't have time for this. She pulled the trigger. There was a sharp recoil as she discharged a round, but the bullet drilled directly into the young man's chest and he crashed heavily to the ground. Bethany felt nothing. No compassion for the victim, no fear that the gunshot would attract attention. She found his phone in ten seconds and took his wallet while she was at it. The phone required facial recognition to unlock it. She held the screen over the young man's dead face, then swiped it up and she was in. She disabled the locking function, then heard sirens in the distance. She pocketed the phone and the wallet, and then she started running again. Danny had made a plan. He would head to the British Embassy. It was the only place he would be safe. There, he'd demand to see the defence attaché, and the suits could do the rest of the work. He checked the location of the embassy on his phone, memorised the route. Then he stood up. His joints were tight, his limbs numb. Pain radiated from the bullet graze. He hadn't heard a siren or a voice for twenty minutes, however, so he was ready to risk moving. He slowly emerged from behind the bin and wiped rain from his eyes. There was nobody about, so he moved to the end of the side street, where it met the busier road. The traffic had died down a little, but there were still no other pedestrians in this torrential rain. He had to force his aching legs into action. He had the uncomfortable sensation of his body letting him down. His route took him north. He estimated that he'd need an hour, plus any time required to put in surveillance on the entrance to the embassy to check the US authorities weren't lying in wait for him. He'd only been moving for ten minutes, however, when two police cars appeared up ahead, screaming down in his direction, forcing him to change his strategy. He was just passing a sports bar, green neon signage and a cartoonish decal of an American football player on the window. He quickly entered. It was a relief to be out of the rain. It was warm inside. It made his soaked clothes feel even more clammy. There was a staircase leading down into the basement where the bar was. He could hear the regular thrum of music from below. Here on the ground floor were toilets. He entered the gents. Two of the cubicles were occupied, but he was able to check himself in the mirror without anybody watching. He was a mess. His hair and clothes and stubble were soaked. There were dark bags under his eyes. His main concern, though, was his sleeve. There was a tear in his jacket where the bullet had grazed it, but any blood had been soaked up by his hoodie. He looked scruffy, but he didn't look as though he'd been shot. If the police cars had passed, he'd leave. If necessary, though, and in the dim light of a bar, he could pass as a loser who'd got caught in the rain. He put one hand through his hair, then exited the gents before the cubicle occupants emerged. But the police cars had stopped outside the bar. The lights were still flashing. Had he been seen? He didn't know. But his decision was made for him. He couldn't leave, at least not this way. His only option was to head down into the bar itself. Perhaps there would be another exit. The volume of music increased as he descended, some heavy guitar band. He pushed his way through a set of double doors and entered the basement. There was a square bar with three bartenders serving in the middle, dim lighting, Thirty or forty punters, all men, most of them at the bar, but a few standing at high tables. The walls were covered with framed pictures of sports stars, some of them signed. 
On one wall, there was a large, smirking picture of the President in front of the Stars and Stripes. There were numerous screens hanging from the ceiling. Some were showing the golf, others baseball. The music was not quite loud enough to drown out people's voices, but nobody seemed to be talking to each other. They were just staring up at the screens or down at their beers. Nobody even noticed Danny as he entered. He looked for alternative exits. There was another set of double doors at the far side of the bar. They swung open and a fourth bartender entered. He caught a glimpse of a washing-up area, but couldn't be certain that it would lead to an exit. He approached the bar and pointed at a Coors beer tap. An unsmiling bartender poured him a beer. Danny didn't want it. He wanted hot, sweet coffee to raise his body temperature, but it was more important to blend in. He took a sip and looked up at the gulf. He only saw five seconds of it because it suddenly changed. A news anchor appeared, and a banner across the bottom of the screen read, Suicide Bomber Latest. Danny pushed his beer away and stared. The image changed. There was shaky camera phone footage of terrified crowds jostling each other. There were fireworks overhead. The wording changed. Walt Disney World terrorist attack. Two dead, many injured. A guy sitting at a stool to Danny's right hand said, Fucking a rabs. His speech was slurred. The image changed again. A face appeared. Danny recognised it. The beard, the vertical scar across the face. It was the man in the deep fake footage, and he braced himself for what might come next. Fucking look at him, slurred the guy on the next bar stool. They got the chair in Florida, and that's too good for him. Danny zoned him out. He read the rolling news banner across the screen. Former Guantanamo Bay suspect throws himself on suicide bomber, foils terror plot in heroic act of self-sacrifice. Danny blinked. He didn't understand. He glanced across the room at the picture of the president smirking down on them. He pictured him sitting in the Oval Office, watching the same news flash, also wondering what the hell had happened. He imagined a room deep in the heart of the Kremlin, where men in suits would be having the same bewildered reaction. He looked to his right and saw the guy by his side properly for the first time. He was white, of course, and he wore a baseball cap with the words, Make America Great Again. He was frowning, as though what he was watching made no sense. Then he looked at his beer, downed it, left a twenty-dollar bill on the bar, and walked out. Danny pulled out his phone. The implications of what he was watching were not fully clear to him, but his duty was. Hereford needed to know that the guy with the scarred eye was the same guy in the General's deep fake footage. He was about to dial into base when the phone vibrated and the screen lit up with an unfamiliar number. Danny hesitated. Should he answer? It was a U.S. number, and that made him edgy. The golf had returned to the screen. The punters were still staring at it like zombies. Danny accepted the call and put the phone to his ear, but didn't speak. He had to listen hard. The music in the bar was a distraction. He blocked his left ear with one finger and could make out the sound of traffic and rain on the other end of the phone. Whoever this was, they were outside. He still didn't speak. If this unknown caller wanted a conversation, they would have to identify themselves first. Hello, Danny, said Bethany White. Danny felt a chill, and it was nothing to do with his wet clothes. The hysterical distress in her voice had gone. Menace and ice had replaced anger and fire. She sounded cold and determined. I don't know where you are, and right now I don't... Don't bother trying to track me. I'll be miles away by the time your people find this phone, but I want you to know something. She paused, as if waiting for Danny to speak. He remained silent. You and your people have taken everything from me. First my husband, now my son. I have nothing left. If I die tomorrow, I wouldn't care. You need to understand that, Danny. I wouldn't care. 
Another pause. What do you want? Danny said. I want you to suffer like I've suffered. And believe me, you will. You'll feel what I'm feeling now. I'll take your loved ones from you one by one. And I'll let you live to mourn them. Because that's what I'll be doing every day for the rest of my life. It occurred to Danny to argue with her to tell her that what had happened to her son was nothing to do with him, that he'd been as much in the dark as she was. But he saved his breath. When Bethany White saw Danny Black, she saw all members of the regiment and security services, and she blamed him for all their betrayals and shortcomings. She sounds like a gorgeous little girl, your daughter Rose. It would be a shame if something terrible happened to her, wouldn't it? The line went dead. Danny stared at the phone. A hot, tingling nausea spread to his stomach. He was aware of nothing else. Not the music, not the screens, not the other people in the bar. He was only aware of Bethany's words, which were ringing in his head like funeral bells. He stood up, pulled a damp banknote from his back pocket, and placed it on the bar without even checking its denomination. As he walked to the exit, he could feel the weight of his sig in the inside pocket of his jacket. He hoped, for their sake, that the police had moved on. Danny Black needed to get back home. He had business there, and nobody was going to stop him. Two miles to the west, Bethany White stood in the yellow light of a street lamp, rain lashing against her skin. She lowered her phone and stared into the middle distance for a moment. Police sirens had started up again, but she didn't care. She saw her boy in her mind's eye, his gentle smile, his soft, innocent face. A sob escaped her throat, and her hands shook, and she felt herself bending over with the anguish of it. But she quickly straightened herself and took several deep breaths. She looked around. Rainwater was gushing into another nearby grate. She strode up to it and dropped the mobile phone into the drain, just as she'd done with the memory stick. She thought of the general and his crazy conspiracy. Was he right? Were the most powerful men in the world manipulating the gullible to tighten their grip on power? She didn't care. She only cared about her son and writing the wrongs that had been done to her. She put her head down and disappeared through the rain and into the darkness. enjoyed this unabridged production of Zero 22 by Chris Ryan. Text copyright 2020 Chris Ryan. Production copyright 2020 Hodder and Stoughton Limited. All rights reserved. For more information about our unabridged audiobooks, please visit www.hodder.co.uk. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.